We turn now to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, marking National Numeracy Day yesterday, the Deputy First Minister declared that all of us need to have a good grasp of numeracy. I agree. So can the First Minister tell us how much has numeracy attainment improved or declined in our schools since she took office? First Minister. Well, I want to pay tribute to uh, national uh, numeracy initiatives. Um, I think the Deputy First Minister managed to spell it correctly when he's promoted it this week. The UK Skills Minister managed to refer to <laughs> National Numeracy uh, Week. But anyway, that, that aside, uh, we see improving attainment uh, across our schools. Uh, for example... <laughs> For example, we see uh, an increasing uh, intake in terms of STEM subjects uh, generally. I'm more than happy to provide the specific numbers on maths uh, for Ruth Davidson later. I don't have them to hand right now. But across the range of uh, subjects in our schools, we're seeing attainment rising. And of course, we're also seeing the attainment gap closing. And that's why we want to continue that progress in the months ahead. Ruth Davidson. Well, I thank the First Minister for that answer, but she won't be able to send me the specific numbers later because she can't give specific numbers. And that's because the Deputy First Minister cancelled the only national survey on numeracy standards we had, which previously allowed us to see how things are going. And that means, as this Parliament's Education Committee declared, no meaningful conclusions on upward or downward trends can be reached at a time of reform within Scottish education. So the Deputy First Minister tells us this week that it's important to have a good grasp of numeracy standards, yet under this SNP government, we have no grasp on how those standards are faring. Does that strike the First Minister as acceptable? First Minister. If it, if it was uh, true, it wouldn't be acceptable, but it's not true. I mean, we provide... Under the achievement of CFE levels uh, data, which replaced the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy, uh, we provide more data at all levels of the system, crucially to underpin improvement activity than we have ever done before. Uh, and the problem with the Scottish Survey of Literacy and Numeracy uh, is that it did not provide data at school or local authority level. And Ruth Davidson doesn't have to take my word for that. In its review of education in Scotland in 2015, uh, this is what the OECD said about that sample approach. It said the light sampling of literacy and numeracy at the national level has not provided sufficient evidence uh, for use in evaluative activities or for national agencies to identify areas of strength. Uh, so that survey wasn't providing the information uh, that we needed. That's why we have replaced it with the achievement of CFE levels data, uh, which does provide the information at not just national level, but school and local authority level as well. I thought that's exactly the kind of progress and improvement that Ruth Davidson might have welcomed. Yeah, yeah. Ruth Davidson. But First Minister, the OECD said to improve SSLN. It didn't say to cancel it. And it's clear from the First Minister's answers that she hasn't actually read what the Education Committee had to say. And the problem is this. New assessments, which we support at P4, P7 and S3, are not comparable. Have a listen. They are not comparable. They cannot show a trend. There is no baseline and they will take time to bed in. And in the meantime, we have no idea whether standards in literacy and numeracy are rising or falling. And the committee was quite explicit. There is a five year gap in our knowledge because of the actions of this SNP government. And the committee is worried that we're losing the data we need for parliament and wider society to hold the government to account for its performance on education, a direct quote. I share the committee's concerns. Doesn't the First Minister share it too? First Minister. We always pay attention to what committees of this Parliament say and we will continue to do that. I just want to pick up uh, Ruth Davidson, something, something she said there about assessments in primary schools. She said very carefully uh, that the Tories support them at P4 and P7. Of course, uh, omitting to say that in their manifesto in the 2016 election, they supported them at P1 as well. Just another example of Ruth Davidson's now legendary flip-flopping on every conceivable issue. There is, not, there is no policies in the Tories and there's not an iota of principle either uh, under Ruth Davidson. But on uh, the achievement of CFE levels data, of course it provides a trend. This is information that is published at school and local authority level each and every year, allowing uh, people to look at the trend data, to look at the improvements uh, where they've been made, and of course to look at whether there are any issues uh, that require to be addressed. I think that's uh, important progress. Uh, Ruth Davidson said the OECD said 
uh, they wanted improvement. That is the improvement that we have provided uh, to deal with the deficiencies in the survey of literacy and numeracy. There's more data now about pupil performance in our schools uh, than there has ever been before. And of course, later this year, we'll get uh, the latest iteration of the PISA international study as well. So there's more information about schools performance than ever before. And crucially, what all of that shows is that we're making progress in raising attainment and closing the attainment gap, which is maybe what Ruth Davidson's a bit disappointed about. Yeah. Ruth Davidson. What the First Minister doesn't get is that if you're the mum of a seven-year-old now, you're not going to know until your child is a teenager whether this country is getting any better at teaching maths or not. And the reason for that... That's true. The reason for that is that the old national survey... You might want to listen to this. The old national survey showed that standards were declining so that this SNP government got the blame and then it cancelled the survey. Yeah. That's what happened. Yeah. And it's left parents without any idea as to whether standards are going up or down. Yeah. And here are the figures that we do know about Scottish schools and numeracy. We've lost more than 400 maths teachers since this SNP came to office. Vacancies have gone up in the last two years. And the last time we did measure numeracy in our schools, we found that Scottish education had gone backwards under this government. I think that parents deserve to know what's happening in our schools, yeah. so why has this First Minister left them in the dark? First Minister. I, I think parents deserve to know what's happening in their children's schools, which is why uh, we now publish uh, the data at school level. Because the reality is, and maybe Ruth Davidson should look into this just a little bit more closely, that under the survey of literacy and numeracy, a parent had no idea what was yeah, happening absolutely. in their child's school because that survey doesn't produce any data at school level. So it had no idea uh, whether the children's school was doing well or doing badly. That's the difference in the data we publish now. It provides data not just at national level, not just at local authority level, it provides the data at individual school level. So parents actually have much more of an idea how their schools are doing than they ever have before. And in terms of, well, Ruth Davidson said, is it going up or down? Attainment in our schools is improving and the attainment gap is closing. These are the facts Ruth Davidson doesn't like. And in terms of teachers, there are more uh, teachers in our schools now than at any time since 2010. There are more primary school teachers in our schools now than at any time since I was at primary school. That's the reality of the progress in our education system. No wonder Ruth Davidson's so furious about it. Thank you. Question number two, Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week. And as a society, we are increasingly open about and understanding of mental health. But we must also recognise that we need to do much more to get our mental health services right, especially at the point of crisis. A year ago, the government announced that an independent inquiry would look at end-to-end -end mental health services in Angus, Dundee and Perth and Kinross. When the then Cabinet Secretary for Health announced the inquiry, she said, it is my aspiration that the independent inquiry will be seen as a force for good. The inquiry needs to be seen as a positive thing. First Minister, do you think that this aspiration is being met? The independent inquiry hasn't reported uh, yet. It is uh, an independent inquiry by definition. Uh, therefore, the Scottish Government is not in control of the timing uh, of that publication. When it is published, uh, we will uh, look at it closely, as I'm sure Parliament as a whole will, and uh, we will implement any recommendations uh, from it, and we will encourage NHS boards uh, to do likewise. Um, Richard Leonard is right to raise uh, mental health. This is, of course, Mental Health Awareness Week. I think it's important that we continue to tackle the stigma, that we invest more, as this government is doing, uh, in preventative uh, mental health services, but that we also continue to make sure that we are investing in specialist care uh, when people need that. Uh, one of the issues, for example, and it's just an example, uh, but I'm citing it because Richard Leonard has raised it uh, previously with me, is the issue of uh, rejected referrals uh, in the CAMS service. Rejected referrals because of the action we're taking are now on a downward uh, trajectory. Uh, that is progress, but there is more progress to make and we're determined to make it. Richard Leonard. Um, I hear what the First Minister says, but can the First Minister listen to these words? 
words which I heard just this morning. Nothing seems to have happened. We're not kept involved. It's definitely not transparent. This is the view of Gillian Murray, whose uncle David's suicide in October 2016 was one of the tragedies which led to this inquiry. So it's clear that for the families involved, those founding aspirations of the Cabinet Secretary are not being met. So will the First Minister reflect on this? And will she tell us what she will do to restore the confidence of those families who have lost loved ones because of failures in the system of mental health support in Tayside? First Minister. Well, can I firstly say to Richard Leonard, of course we want to learn lessons from uh, the experiences of the kind uh, narrated by Richard Leonard here today, and my sympathies are with any family uh, who've had experiences of that nature. Uh, but also say to Richard Leonard, and I hope he takes this point seriously, we established an independent inquiry um, into mental health services across Tayside um, as a result uh, of some of the cases that he has brought to the Chamber. That independent inquiry hasn't yet reported. I hope it will report soon. Uh, when it does, I am sure it will be fully scrutinised by members across this chamber and the Scottish Government and the Health Service more generally will ensure that we reflect carefully on that and learn any lessons that it says require to be learned. But I think it would be wrong to preempt the outcome of that inquiry, particularly when, as I understand it, it is due to report imminently. Uh, so I look forward to uh, its publication and, as I say, give an assurance that the Scottish Government will take forward any recommendations that it makes. Richard Leonard. Uh, Presiding officer, the terms of reference set for this inquiry state that it must consider the perspective and give voice to families, patients, carers and others who have experience of suicide or involvement with mental health services within Tayside. That means the voice of people like Mandy McLaren, the mother of Dale Thompson, who tragically completed suicide in January 2015. Mandy asked me this morning, to ask you directly, First Minister, will you ensure, will you ensure that the families receive an advanced copy of the interim report, which is due in the next few weeks? So will you listen to the voices of those families and will you do what you can do to help restore their confidence in this inquiry? First Minister. Um, this inquiry has been led, as I know Richard Leonard is aware, by David Strang. It is an independent inquiry. If the government was interfering in the conduct of that inquiry, I'm sure Richard Leonard would be raising that in the chamber. Um, as I understand it, although David Strang has taken this forward independently, David Strang has met with family members. I, I think that uh, would have been expected of him. It would be my full expectation in any uh, inquiry of this nature that an advanced copy of the report would go to those directly affected. I will pass uh, that specific point back to David Strang. Uh, but I, I would stress again, this is an independent inquiry and it's right that the government allows it to be conducted entirely independently of government. I would expect the report, although as I say I'm not in control of the timing of this, I would expect the report to be published imminently and at that point uh, it will be for all MSPs right across the chamber to look carefully at it and the Scottish Government uh, certainly will be doing so. We have a number of constituency supplementaries. Jackie Bailey to be followed by Sandra White. The First Minister may be aware that the provision of out-of-hours services in Greater and Glasgow and Clyde continue to be a significant problem. At the Vale of Leven Hospital, the out-of-hours service was closed 88 times last year. It's been closed 44 times in the first four months of this year, and it was closed this weekend. So hundreds of patients had to make the long journey to the RAH in Paisley for what should be the most basic local provision. Will the First Minister ensure the out-of-hours services are improved and retained at the Vale of Leven Hospital. First Minister. Uh, it has always been our uh, intention since uh, I was Health Secretary to ensure that as many services as possible out of hours and other services are retained at the Vale of Leven Hospital. The Health Secretary has advised me she's due to visit the Vale of Leven Hospital next month and I'm sure uh, she will have these discussions uh, with staff there. Specifically on the issue of out of hours, uh, I would expect NHS Greater and Glasgow uh, Health Board, as I would expect all health boards, to take every measure possible to ensure uh, safety and sustainable out of hours uh, services. Uh, I know there have been uh, some issues uh, recently at the Vale of Leven, but I would expect the board to work hard uh, to rectify those so that those services are there locally for the people who need them. 
Sandra White to be followed by Edward Mountain. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the First Minister will be aware of the issue regarding Sabir Zazé, Chief Executive of the Scottish Refugee Council. Glasgow University, which is my constituency, are awarding Sabir an honorary doctorate, and yet the Home Office are refusing his father a visa to enter the UK to attend the ceremony, which is absolutely disgraceful. First Minister, are there any steps whatsoever that the Scottish Government can take to apply pressure on the UK Government to ensure Mr Sabir's Family, father can enter the country and attend this very significant ceremony. First well, for those who know uh, Shabir Zazi, uh, they will know that he has made a significant contribution uh, over 20 years in the UK in supporting refugees and communities. And let me take the opportunity today to thank him uh, for the contribution he makes to this country. And I am delighted. Delighted that the University of Glasgow has also chosen to recognise that. Um, I think all of us uh, would understand that it is entirely natural that he would want to share this outstanding achievement with his father. Uh, and it's quite hard, I think, for any of us to comprehend uh, the disappointment that he must feel that his father's visa has been refused. Um, I think that is shameful and utterly inexplicable and I would call on the UK Government to reflect very carefully on it. Uh, the Community Secretary has written to the UK Minister for Immigration to ask her to look into this case uh, and I would reiterate that request very, very strongly indeed today. Edward Mountain to be followed by James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, given the proposed day of strike action by high Isle air traffic controllers on Thursday of next week, can you give the Chamber an update on the Scottish Government's contingency plans to minimise disruption to businesses, families and indeed patients in the Highlands and Islands? First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say uh, how disappointing it is that this industrial action is taking place and I would uh, appeal uh, to both the uh, employer and employees uh, to continue to discuss how this can be resolved in order that there is no disruption uh, to the travelling public. It is, of course, for HIAL uh, to ensure that it has contingency plans in place and I know they are uh, working to do that and I'm sure HIAL will be uh, very glad uh, to engage directly with any interested member of Parliament. And James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Data published this week by the University of Loughborough uh, revealed that child poverty levels in Glasgow are running at 37%. In the First Minister's own Glasgow Southside constituency, they are 46%, the highest of any constituency in Scotland. At a time when we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the founding of the Scottish Parliament, the fact that children are growing up in Nicola Sturgeon's constituency living in poverty is a damning criticism of this, of this government. All over Glasgow, all over, all over Glasgow, all over Glasgow, Order, children are growing up hungry and in overcrowded houses. The time for soft words and platitudes is over. First Minister, what will you do? with the powers at your disposal to give these kids some hope and lift them out of poverty. First Minister. Well, firstly, can I say that child poverty in Scotland is too high? I've said that previously. Uh, of course, child poverty in Scotland uh, is lower than it is in any other part of the UK, uh, but it is still too high. Uh, that is why we are taking action to mitigate the impact of welfare cuts. It's why we are providing uh, more support to low-income families through, for example, the Best Start grant. It's why, uh, why we're tackling the root causes of, of poverty. It's why we're investing record sums in affordable housing across the country. Uh, and it's why, of course, we will bring forward uh, plans for an income supplement. Uh, James Kelly is right to raise the issue, but I know that he wants to characterise this as it uh, all somehow being the fault of the SNP uh, government. Interestingly, <laughs> interestingly, uh, the End Child Poverty report that was published yesterday uh, actually found that Wales was the only part of the UK to see an overall increase in the percentage of children in poverty in the past year. 
um, and the Welsh Government uh, said that that was entirely down to UK Government welfare cuts and in particular universal credit. So why is it that James Kelly's colleagues in Wales can see what the root causes of poverty in this country are uh, but the Scottish Labour Party can? It would fit the Scottish Labour Party uh, better if they supported the work that this Government was doing and they joined with this Government in asking for all welfare policies to be devolved to this Parliament. Question number three, Patrick Harvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Over a decade ago, the first budget concession the Greens ever won from the SNP was the Climate Challenge Fund. Since then, it's funded over a thousand communities across Scotland, helping them waste less, switch to greener, transport, grow food locally, and much more. We've been hearing of communities losing their grants, and this morning, the ferret reports the true scale of what's happening. Total funding at its lowest ever level, funding for new projects slashed in half, and scores of projects which were recommended for grants turned down. That includes South Seeds in the First Minister's own constituency, where three members of staff have been made redundant, and tens of thousands of households and residents won't get the services they need. Now that the First Minister has declared a climate emergency, why is the government sacking our first responders? Minister. Well, the Climate Change Fund is uh, the only fund of its kind in the UK, and I think it is important uh, that that is the case. Uh, there are always a large number of applications for the fund. I know how competitive it is from the example of South Seeds in my own constituency. Uh, 22 new projects were funded this year. It's important to point out, though, that that is in addition to the 65 uh, projects that were funded last year that now have a second year of funding and uh, the total spend uh, this year will be eight million uh, pounds. Uh, the total spend across 2019 to 21 will be uh, more than nine million pounds. And of course, the Climate Change Fund is part of the overall Sustainable Action Fund, which it uh, has seen an increase in funding this year. Uh, that said, as I have uh, stated in the Chamber in recent weeks, all of our policies require review in light of the report of the Committee on Climate Change, which has led us to increase our emissions targets. And that will include looking at the role of the Climate Change Fund in supporting communities to play their full part in tackling climate change. Patrick Harvey. Well, the, the government has started a review of this fund, but then pulled the rug from under people before that review is finished. And the budget as presented to Parliament included funds for this scheme. We would certainly not have approved it if it had set out this cut. Last year, this fund helped 65 new projects across Scotland. This year, it's just 22. And 43 of them, 43 projects recommended for approval by the Independent Grants Panel have been turned down. These aren't just numbers. These are people. These are people committed to taking climate action and being leaders in their communities. Projects are being abandoned and jobs are being lost. Look, when the Greens criticise the government for handing cash to the fossil fuel industry or the arms trade, the response is jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, these jobs matter too. This is a serious mistake. Will the First Minister step in and replace the lost funding for the communities that have been affected by this cut? First Minister. Well, I do think these are important issues. Uh, and just to reiterate a point that I think uh, was lost uh, there, that uh, the 65 projects that were funded last year also have funding in this year. The 22 are over and above that. So as I said a moment ago, the total funding this year uh, is eight uh, million pounds. Yes, we have to look at all of these things in light of recent developments around climate change. And I give an undertaking to the Chamber today that not only uh, in terms of uh, the Climate Change Fund uh, or the wider Sustainable Action Fund, which this sits with which has had an increase in budget this year, that we will look carefully at all of these things and so, so that we can be satisfied that we are living up to our responsibilities. Question number four, Willie Rennie. This week, a GP told me he had stopped referring patients to mental health services because the waiting times are so long or there is no prospect of them ever getting treated. <coughs> the First Minister has promised those patients that they get mental health treatment when they need it. They feel let down. Are they wrong? First Minister. Uh, I think any patient that waits longer for treatment uh, than we want them to wait, uh, than the targets say they should uh, wait, is entitled uh, to feel very aggrieved uh, about that. So 
um, I would apologise to any patient in uh, those circumstances. In terms of waiting times, uh, generally, we are and Jean Freeman has set this out uh, to the Chamber, we are investing £850 million uh, to meet waiting times targets. Uh, in terms of mental health, we are investing uh, significantly to improve mental health services, not just specialist services, uh, but preventative and community services as well. That is particularly important around CAMS, child and adolescent mental health services, where we now see the average waiting time uh, falling uh, and, as I said, rejected referrals uh, down. So uh, there is work still to do, but we are investing and we are pursuing the policies that are about, about getting the right treatment in place for people uh, when they need it. Willie Rennie. If warm words could treat people faster, the First Minister wouldn't have thousands of people waiting for mental health services. One in five people are waiting over 18 weeks. Some are waiting as long as two years, and some never get any help. The First Minister says she takes this seriously, but her government's mental health strategy was 15 months late. The suicide strategy was 20 months late, and it is 700 staff short of its own recruitment plan. GPs, accident emergency departments and police officers have to pick up the pieces because these patients have nowhere else to go. In Mental Health Week, years, years after I first asked her, why are people still waiting so long? First Minister. Well, I'd say to you already, if, if warm words uh, was all that people were being offered, he might have a point. But we are seeing budgets increasing for mental health. The budget for mental health is uh, now over a billion uh, pounds. We're seeing staffing numbers uh, working in mental health, not just in our health service, but we're committed to investing in increased staffing in other settings across uh, the country. He mentions the mental health strategy and the suicide strategy. Uh, I think at Willie uh, Rennie's request, we took time to do further consultation on those strategies to make... Uh, to make sure that we were taking the views of all stakeholders properly into account. Uh, so we are determined to continue the work we're doing here to make sure people get access to specialist services when they need it, but that fewer people need to refer to specialist services because we've got the community and preventative services in place. That's what we are focused on and we'll continue to work on the progress we're making. Some further supplementaries. The first from Keith Brown to be followed by Ian Gray. Keith Brown. The Prime Minister's Brexit deal has been dead now for some months and the UK Government is wasting the Brexit extension with no meaningful talks having taken place. Any backroom deal struck with the Labour Party will leave Scotland outside the single market costing £2,300 per person. And yet the Prime Minister has the audacity to proclaim that MPs have a duty to support her. Does the First Minister think that SNP MPs have a duty to vote to make Scotland poorer? First Minister. I don't think any MP should be voting to make uh, Scotland or the UK poorer. Uh, SNP MPs will vote against the withdrawal agreement bill because it takes Scotland out of the EU against our will. It takes us out of the single market against our will. Uh, the fact is the Prime Minister is only bringing this withdrawal agreement bill forward to buy herself more time. It's about preserving uh, her own party, though I'm not sure uh, those attempts are going to be successful. It's not about acting in the best interests of the country. The Tories' uh, actions uh, and behaviour on Brexit is utterly shameful. Uh, and I think in an electoral sense, they're probably going to get uh, what they deserve in Scotland uh, next week at the European elections. And uh, people, quite rightly, uh, will be expressing the degree of anger they have at this whole Westminster Brexit fiasco. Ian Gray to be followed by... Gillian Martin, Ian Gray. <clears throat> Thank you, President Officer. Scotland's college lecturers are on strike again today and they're demonstrating outside Parliament as we speak. All they want is a fair cost of living pay increase in line with public pay policy, something they have been denied for three years. Their employers remain intransigent, determined to conflate this claim with the quite separate introduction of national pay scales. Will the First Minister intervene now and get the colleges to agree a fair settlement? And if not, will she come out with me after FMQs and explain to those lecturers, to their face, why not? First Minister. It always, it always kind of amazes me the number of times that Labour members, proud trade unionists, get up in this chamber and ask me to intervene in national bargaining uh, between employers yeah. and, and yeah. trade unions. Yeah. Um, I want to see this dispute 
resolved. Um, I think it is deeply disappointing that talks didn't manage to build on the positive progress that has been made over the last few weeks. And I would appeal to both sides to get round the table, to stay round the table and to resolve this issue. Uh, the Scottish Government, of course, is funding in full the additional cost of the harmonisation of pay terms and conditions, which is around uh, £100 million over three years. We're investing heavily in Scotland's colleges. And I would say to uh, the employers, uh, as well as uh, the, the trade unions, but let me uh, focus on the employers, that all of us want to see uh, this resolved. And I hope it is resolved uh, sooner rather than later. But it is the responsibility of those involved in national bargaining to reach that resolution. Julian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Brexit still hasn't happened, and yet the damage has already been done. Today, there are doubts over whether Thomas Cook, a travel company with 180 years of history, can continue as a going concern. Does this not demonstrate the impact of Brexit on ordinary families, and in this case, families looking forward to their well-earned holidays, and why it's so important to show that Scotland says no to Brexit next Thursday? First Minister. Brexit is having an impact on individuals, uh, businesses, the length and breadth of the country. I visited Glasgow University uh, yesterday to hear about the impact it's having on EU nationals working at or studying at that university. It's disgraceful, uh, the impact that it is having. I think the vast majority of people in Scotland want to see an end to Brexit and an end to this Westminster chaos. Uh, so people can exercise uh, that view next Thursday uh, by voting uh, for, uh, well, it won't surprise anybody to hear me say this, voting for the SNP to say quite clearly that Scotland wants to stay in Europe well, and Scotland wants an end First to Minister, Brexit. First Minister, I would rather you didn't. I hope the First Minister will not encourage people to vote directly in, and campaign in this, in this chamber. That extends, that extends to every member in this chamber. No blatant electioneering, please. Question number five, James Dornan. To ask the First Minister how the Scottish Government is marking Mental Health Awareness Week. Oh, First Minister. <laughs> Uh, the theme of this year's Awareness Week is body image, which is an important factor in mental well-being. The Mental Health Minister launched Mental Health Awareness Week at Glasgow Central Station, where uh, she and the Mental Health Foundation spoke to members of the public uh, to raise awareness about this issue. She also visited Girl Guiding Scotland to hear firsthand from Girl Guides how body image affects them. Ahead of Awareness Week, we announced a new advisory group which will examine how body image impacts on young people's mental well-being. The group will identify steps to improve support for young people and advice for relevant professionals and that will build on our package of measures to improve the mental health of young people. James Dornan. <clears throat> Thank the First Minister for that answer. Last week we had the sad news that Dr Dame Denise Coyer had to step down from the CAMS task force due to ill health. Does the First Minister agree with me that Denise Coyer should be thanked for taking forward this important work and can she outline how the task force work will be taken forward to implementation? First Minister. Uh, well, I am uh, very sorry indeed that due to illness, Dr Dame Denise Coya has had to stand down as chair of the Children and Young People's Mental Health Task Force. Dr Coya has shown exemplary dedication as chair of the task force to help improve the mental health of children and young people. And I want to extend my thanks to her and send my very best wishes to her. And I'm sure uh, I do that on behalf of the whole chamber. Um, of course, we established the task force jointly with COSLA in June 2018 to provide a blueprint for delivering a new approach. Dr Coya's work has brought the task force to an advanced stage and their next step is working towards implementation. Uh, as it happens, the task force is meeting today to shape how they will take this important work forward. Annie Wells to be followed by David Stewart. <clears throat> Thank you. Firstly, I would like to stress my support for Mental Health Awareness Week. And it's absolutely right that mental health is now near the top of the political agenda. However, while we hear talk from the SNP is good, the reality for those who need support is far different. The SNP pledged to hire an extra 800 mental health workers, but the latest statistics show that only 106 have been hired in the last two years. Can the First Minister outline what specific action her government will take to ensure the target is met by the end of 21 22 rather than being missed spectacularly. First Minister. Uh, we're on track uh, to deliver on that target. It was, as Annie Wells uh, has acknowledged, a multi-year uh, target. In addition to that, of course, we have commitments uh, to increase the number of school counsellors. Uh, £60 million has been invested to support an additional 350 counsellors in education. Uh, the first tranche of them will be in place from the start 
of the 2019-20 school year. And again, that commitment is on track to be delivered uh, by the start of the 2020-2021 school year. Uh, also, we've committed to putting an additional 250 school nurses in place by 2022. In the first tranche of 50 additional school nurses will be recruited in the current academic year. So across all of these areas, uh, there is a real focus, as I commented earlier, uh, not just ensuring specialist services are there when people need them, but investing in the kind of preventative services uh, that hopefully stop uh, people needing those specialist services in the first place. And David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. So the First Minister will be well aware that people with diabetes are twice as likely to experience depression. Three quarters of people living with diabetes who wanted specialist mental health support couldn't get it. What is the Scottish Government doing to improve support for people living with diabetes through emotional, psychological and mental health care? First Minister. As Dave Stewart is aware, uh, because I know he takes a close interest in this, uh, there's a range of work uh, taken forward by the Scottish Government to help those uh, who have diabetes. I will ask the Mental Health Minister to write to him with specific details of how we support uh, people with diabetes, specifically uh, with mental health uh, challenges, because as he rightly says, that is a a significant aspect of what uh, diabetes patients uh, deal with. So I'll ask the Mental Health Minister to provide that information as soon as possible. And question number six, Miles Briggs. The First Minister, what the Scottish Government's response is to the Scottish Heart Health uh, Fellow Nurse Forum's warning of a potential crisis in care delivery. First Minister. Uh, we are committed to improving uh, prevention, treatment and care for patients with heart disease and are taking a range of actions to achieve this through the Heart Disease Improvement Plan. The decrease in mortality rates and in the number of new cases of coronary heart disease over the past decade uh, show that that strategy uh, is having success. Uh, I welcome the Heart Failure Nurse Forum's report which makes six recommendations for improvements and we will consider these carefully with NHS boards. Since 2015 we've invested over £2.4 million a year to support NHS boards to provide enhanced access to specialist nursing services including cardiac nurses and I expect NHS boards to ensure that people with heart failure have access to a range of health professionals to ensure appropriate management of their condition. Miles Briggs. First Minister for the answer, but the report notes that there's been little investment in specialist health failure, failure services over the past six years, and there's now fewer heart failure nurses than there were 10 years ago. Nearly 46,000 people across Scotland are living with devastating impacts of heart failure. So can the First Minister confirm today how much the Scottish Government will commit to investing in the delivery of heart failure nurse teams, and given the progress being made in NHS England and, and Wales in both contributing to the National Cardiac Audit, supporting data-led redesign of service and provision, will the Scottish Government commit to a nationally addressing the lack of data support to design better services for patients? First Minister. Well, as I said in my original answer, since 2015 we've invested uh, over £2.4 million uh, for enhanced access to specialist nursing services, and that includes cardiac nurses. I'll ask the Health Secretary to write to Miles Briggs with uh, the, the projected spend uh, over the next uh, few years. Uh, of course, that sits within a picture of an overall rising number of nurses uh, within Scotland. Uh, so we'll continue to invest and indeed work with uh, different organisations uh, who have expertise here to make sure we're providing the right uh, support and services uh, for patients. And I think it's important that while there's a lot of work here uh, still to do and the recommendations made in uh, the Scottish Heart Failure Nurse Forum report are looked at carefully, uh, between 2008 and 2017, the mortality rate for coronary heart disease uh, for all ages uh, decreased by 36%. For the under 75s, the decrease was 33%. So uh, that is going in the right direction. Uh, that suggests the actions that we are taking uh, are having success and we'll continue to make sure that we take that action. And Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Cardiologist Professor Colin Berry um, recently came to Parliament to present his research on women's heart health to the cross-party group on women's health. His research finds that women are less likely than men to be properly diagnosed with a heart attack and twice as likely to die in hospital. Is the First Minister also aware that a valuable test which diagnoses small vessel heart disease, a condition which particularly affects women, is not routinely available and can she advise what the government is doing to improve women's heart health more generally? First Minister. We are aware of this issue. In fact, the Chief Medical Officer is currently looking at the particular issue that Monica Lennon raises and indeed she is a real champion for improvements in women's health. It is the case that often the symptoms of heart attacks in women are different to those experienced by men, uh, but many health professionals will be uh, more aware of those traditionally experienced by men. And 
In uh, fact, uh, a recent book published that I would recommend to everybody in the Chamber, Invisible Women, uh, looks at some of these issues that uh, really systemise some of the discrimination uh, against women in our society. So these are important issues and uh, I'll give Monica Lennon an assurance that they are actively being looked at by the Scottish Government. Thank you very much. And that concludes First Minister's questions. We're going to turn shortly to members' business in the name of Alexander Stewart on Community Pharmacy Scotland. And we will, uh, but we'll do so in a few moments. We'll have a short suspension to allow members, uh, the public and ministers to change their seats. A short suspension. <laughs>